Hello guys, um, my name is Tai Batali and I'm a registered nurse, um, born again Christian and also a daughter in FCN. I currently live and work in the United Kingdom where I'm currently practicing as an infection prevention and control specialist nurse. Um, I'm very privileged to be sharing um, with you um, a topic today titled My Long Lost Kinswoman Reaching the Unreachable from um, a series that we're currently doing, My Kinswoman Redefining Sisterhood. And I think this is a very profound um, topic for me. And it's also very personal to me. And I'll explain why in the course of, of the conversation. Um, first off, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to speak to each other, to enlighten one another, from your word. We pray that the spirit of truth, the spirit of grace will illuminate our hearts and our soul. You would grant us divine understanding of your word. You would reach every heart, every soul and every mind. You will carry the words of this message and you would interpret it to every soul in a way that is applicable and in a way that is practicable. Thank you, blessed Redeemer, because you are the spirit of grace, you are the spirit of truth, you are the spirit of light. In your light do we see light. Thank you, sweet Holy Spirit, because tonight you will speak to us, you will journey with us, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're watching this series, you're not watching by mistake, and I plead with you that you should please um, stay on with me until the end. And I pray that you'll be blessed in Jesus' name. So, redefining sisterhood. My long lost king's woman reaching the unreachable. Wow, it's amazing. For me, it's an amazing opportunity. And just for the sake of easy communication, I've titled the first part of this message, The Voice of Hope, Representing and Representing the Gospel. Representing and Representing the Gospel. Um, at first, I pondered a lot about this theme because I was a lost king's woman myself. I'd given up on overcoming a life of sin, a life of suffering, a life of pain, because I tried so much at some point in my life and I just got tired. I just thought, well, this is how it's going to be. And I remember 2020, 2021, I kept writing in my diary over and over again, the phrase beyond redemption, because I thought mm, this must be what the Bible says when it says that there's some people that have tasted of the power of this world, of the power of the world to come. They've seen visions, they've experienced a, a taste of heaven, that if they should fall away, it would be hard to bring them back. So I thought, I judged myself and I thought, I've reached the stage that's beyond redemption. So this is how I'm going to be until I die. I had mapped out a journey for myself and I didn't care if it was going to end in destruction. I just thought, well, there's nothing else I can do. But I'm sitting here today and I'm grateful for the people that reached out to me in that time. And many of them did not make sense at the time. And many of them were just like little seeds, little messages, little words of encouragement here and there. No one had any idea what I was passing through. Even I, I'm not sure I could effectively communicate it. But I just knew I was at a point in my life where I thought, I'm far from God. Maybe God doesn't care about me. But I'm glad we're here today and I'm glad I can share a few things with you. Glory to Jesus. And I pray that these few things will be helpful to myself and to you as well. So last year I heard the testimony of a mother who had been praying for the salvation of her son for 10 years. And I sat in that crowd and I thought to myself, Tybat, why did you stop praying? Because I'd been praying for, his, for the salvation of a people for so long, but it just got to a point I just gave up because I thought it's not happening the way I want it to happen. It's not happening as fast as I wanted it to happen. So I just gave up, you know, maybe here and there I'll mutter a little word of prayer, but it wasn't anything fervent. It wasn't my desire anymore. I, I'd just given up on hoping for the salvation of these people. And I asked myself, sat in the crowd that day, why did I stop praying? Why? You know, it still hasn't happened. But when I heard that woman's testimony, I thought 10 years, you know, the son eventually gave his life to Christ last year. I thought to myself, 10 years. So I started praying again. I started praying again. I started doing everything I could to see that salvation will come to these people because I hold them very dear to my heart. And... It hasn't happened yet, but I'm hopeful 
there's been progress and I'm still praying and I will continue to pray. Now, the first thing we must understand in reaching out to sisters or to the, to the world in general is that it's, not, it's simply not our job to do. It's not your job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit. And it's the job that the Holy Spirit does through the personality of Jesus that has been formed in us. And I would like to first highlight a few barriers to reaching out. Pardon me. The first one I'm going to highlight is misrepresentation of the gospel. Some of us are not preaching Christ in our sermons when we do preach. Some of us are preaching our church doctrines. Some of us are preaching good works. And don't get me wrong, good works is not necessarily a bad thing. Pay your tithes, pay your offerings. By all means, give to the needy, give to the poor. You know, by all means, fast, pray. Good works is actually good. But it's only good, it's only effective when it's based upon faith and it's coming from a place of the grace that God supplies. But the foundation of our conversations when reaching out must be based on the finished work of Christ. It must be based on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. This is the basis of any reaching out we are going to do. The gospel is simple, and it's God's change agent. And we know that no man, no man comes to the Father except the Father draws him close. But the same scripture also urges us to pray that the Lord of the harvest will send laborers into the field. So we must focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power thereof, because anything else we preach outside of this is just a waste of time. And even if we do succeed, you know, bringing it with a few people close, we might not be able to keep them or we might not be able to achieve much that way. Our focus must be the focus of heaven so that we would not just be out of line so that we will not be so out of line and so that we will not be doing so much and yet achieving so little john 3 and verse 16 what is the gospel for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life i love the book of titus chapter 2 from verse um, 11 to 14 it says for the grace of god that brings salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that denying ungodliness worldly lust we should live soberly righteously and godly in the present in this present age looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our lord jesus and savior jesus christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works that's titus Titus 2 from verse 11 to 14. This is the gospel. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. And it teaches us to, de it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly passions. To live soberly, you know, as we wait for the coming of the Lord Jesus. Romans, 10 and, uh, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 says that with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And in Romans 1 verse 16, the writer says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. So I don't see how we can bring men unto salvation if we are not preaching the very essence of salvation itself. I don't understand how we can reach out to anyone if we are trying to reach out to anyone outside of the, outside of the finished work and outside of the personality of Christ himself. Number two, failure to embody the personality of Christ. <clears throat> In this age and time, we have so many sorts of believers. We have believers who are professing that they are born again, but we cannot find the attitude of Christ in them. And don't get me wrong, not that I have attained perfection, but I am. I make bold to say that there is a work that Christ is doing in me. The Bible says that there is he that worketh in us, but to will and to do of his good pleasure. So this is the place that we all must come into. Some of us have not been able to internalize what we've learned from scripture. So it's sitting with us, but it's sitting with us at head knowledge. We are redeemed. We are saved. We are delivered. And we're not necessarily struggling with sin. We don't lie. We don't cheat. You know, we keep all the commandments. We do everything right. As a matter of fact, some of us are perfect in the eyes of anyone who observes us. And that is not even a bad thing at all. As a matter of fact, it's another feather to your cap. It's a good thing. But we are living life by our own codes. We are living life by our own moral conduct. Again, it's not really a problem. It becomes a problem when it's a stumbling block for God to use you. It becomes a problem when you are too rigid. You, be, you become immalleable. God cannot beat you into any shape that he wants. He cannot direct you into any form or any stature that he wants. That's when it becomes a problem. Some of us, although we are redeemed like Peter, we have been with Jesus like Peter. But even if Jesus himself gives us meat, we would not eat it because we think that it, that is what defiles a man. Despite the fact that Peter had sat at the feet of Jesus and Jesus had already told them, he taught them. He said it is not what goes into a man that defiles a man, but what comes out of him. 
And here we see Peter. He's being fed with a large sheet let down from heaven. But Peter would not dare eat it because he has never touched any unclean thing from the day he was born. Even after Jesus had told him that it is not what goes into a man that defiles a man. Now tell me how Peter will be able to reach a Cornelius if he will not touch an unclean thing. If he will not associate with the people who have been tagged unclean. We must look to Jesus. Christ is our pattern, is our perfect model. Outside of the personality of Christ, we are likely to go wrong and we are likely to miss a lot of things. But within the confines of the personality of Christ, we are likely to reach more people. We are likely to achieve more that way. So that Jesus can be revealed and be glorified through us. This is our, this is our goal. This is our aim in life. Number three, love non-personified. <laughs> love non-personified. Can you love a sister to a fault? No, I'm asking you. When last did you weep? When last did you weep in the place of prayer because you were traveling for a soul? No one is immune to love. I need you to know that. The love of God must be shed abroad in our hearts because this is what the scripture says when we accept Christ, when we confess the person of Christ, when we receive the Holy Ghost. It's not just so that we can be on fire and speak in tongues and cast demons. One of the very first work that the Holy Spirit does in us is that he sheds the love of God abroad in our hearts. So the love of God is not just the ability to love God, but it is the ability to express that love in loving our fellow man. Because even John says it's not possible for you to say that you love God that you have not seen when you cannot love the man that you can see. So no man is immune to love. The gospel changes people by the power of love. Your persuasion skills cannot compel people to God. Even if you manage, you will achieve so little that way. But can you become love? No, because this is my life's goal. I want to become love. You know, can you become love? Can we can can people be looking for the love of God and find you? You know, in, in Luke 19 from verse 41 to 44, we see Jesus weeping for Jerusalem because of the destruction that was going to befall her. Love does not rejoice in the face of wrong. Love compels, love constrains. You know, the scripture says, but the love of Christ compels us, but the love of Christ constrains us. Love can be moved. Love is compassionate. The key language of love is compassion. You know, Gary Chapman wrote that book, Five Love Languages. It's a good book. I love the book. I haven't read it, but I've heard a lot about it. I've heard a lot about it. But I make bold to tell you that the key language of love is compassion. A person cannot tell you that they love you and they don't have any idea of compassion on, on you or for you. They're not. That's not love. That's not love because I, I feel like it, even from the pages of scriptures, we can see that over and over again. This is how Jesus himself expressed love. This is how Jesus himself showed love. This is how we know that love was moving Jesus. Many times in the scriptures, you will see the phrase and Jesus be moved with compassion and everything that follows it. Every time you see Jesus being moved with compassion, whatever follows it, it's either a miracle, a healing, a deliverance, a casting out of demons. Kabayada. <laughs> So the key language of love is compassion. Love is spiritual, honestly. You cannot ask the flesh for what only the spirit can produce. So love is a fruit of the spirit. As a matter of fact, love is the fruit of the spirit. So it's not something that your flesh can produce. It's, it's a work that the Holy Spirit does within us. But it has expression. And one of the expressions of love, the key expression of love is compassion. If you don't have compassion on men, you might end up like Jonah, that God will give you a message of destruction and you might not be able to deliver that message because compassion is lacking. So yes, you have a message that can deliver a people. You have a message that can set a people free. But because compassion is lacking, there is a gap and men cannot come to salvation. Men cannot come to the knowledge of Christ. Love wrought mighty miracles if channeled through the power of God. Where you see love and you see the power of the Holy Spirit in operation. Oh my God. Wonderful things happen. Miracles happen. Number four, overemphasis on the sufferings of partnering with the gospel. I'm not going to dwell too much on this point, but it feels like to me, from where I'm sitting, it feels like on one part of the world, we have believers that will tell you our God is a consuming fire. We have believers that will tell you in this world, you will face tribulations. We have believers that will tell you Christianity is a hard journey. It's not an easy journey. You will see a lot. You will face tribulation. You will face persecution. And then on, on the other hand, we have believers that will tell 
tell you, oh, the, the, the kingdom of God is in righteousness, is in peace, is in joy, in the Holy Ghost. I'm able to tell you that. I think I actually prefer the people on this side. Yes, the Bible says in this world you will face tribulations, but the same scripture also says, be of good cheers, for I have overcome the world. This is Jesus himself speaking. Scripture says, my peace I give it unto you, not like the world give it, give it I unto you. So you see apostles like Paul, apostles like Peter, imprisoned, locked down, chained, and they were telling believers, they were writing letters to believers, and in those letters they were saying, be of good cheers be happy greet one another with an old with a holy kiss people that were in prison does that sound to you like people that were unhappy we see peter in the scriptures the bible says he was chained hands and legs and they put beside him two soldiers guess what peter was doing he was sleeping does that sound to you like someone that is bothered does that sound to you like someone that is scared of the events that are around him the kingdom of God is not in eating and drinking, it's in righteousness, it's in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Pastor Andy Osakwe will say it is in ha 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 in the Holy Ghost. So my dear sister, don't be too weighed down by the tribulations of the world. Don't be too weighed down by the persecutions around you. Yes, we will face tribulations, but please be of good cheers. Christianity is attractive. Christianity is beautiful. Raw powder, wear lip gloss, be fine, wear a pretty smile. I'm going through a lot, but I am also going through a lot in Christ. You don't get it. Let the joy of the Holy Spirit overshadow your soul. Let the joy of the Holy Spirit, let it take over your soul. Be led of the Spirit. It's not only, the Holy Spirit does not only lead us to speak in tongues, to raise the dead, to do all these powerful things. The Holy Spirit also helps us to channel our emotions right. The Holy Spirit also helps us to maintain stability, to maintain calm in the face of a storm. The Holy Spirit also helps us to be beautiful. He helps us to be attractive. He helps us to live gracefully. Like that woman that lost her son and the prophet asked her, what's going on? She said, all is well. All is well. The woman was fine. She was okay. She just knew. She was just convinced that something good was going to come out of this. The Bible, the literal word for the literal translation for gospel is good news. The Bible says that good news from a far country is like cold water to a thirsty soul. Proverbs twenty five and twenty five. I love that scripture so much. So that means that. As many souls that are thirsty, if we give them the good news, they should be filled. And that is what Jesus told the Samaritan woman. This is Bible. I'm not manufacturing it from my head. That's what Jesus told the Samaritan woman. He said, if you come, I will give you that. If you knew who was speaking to you, you will ask for the living water and I will give it to you and you will never thirst anymore. So how do we give people good news? And they are more depressed than before the conversation even started. They might be initially pricked in their hearts. They might be convicted of their sins. But the end product of it is there must be joy and there must be gladness. So if you are preaching the gospel and people are becoming more depressed, people are becoming more sad, maybe you're not doing it right. Maybe you're not doing it right. I'm going to read from the book of Acts chapter 2 from verse 37. It's quite a long read, but write with me. In verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received this word were baptized. Gladly received this word were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them three thousand souls. And when they continued steadfastly in the and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came unto every soul, and many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And all they that believed were, were together, and they had all things in common, and sold their possessions and their goods and parted unto and parted them to all men as every man had need and they continually daily with one accord in the temple breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness 
and singleness of mind, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So we see that at the beginning of that scripture, they were pricked in their hearts. And then there were, some of them were even scared. They were asking, what should we do that we might be saved? But in the end of it, we see that the Bible says they were breaking bread from house to house. Does that sound to you like people that are bothered? Or does it sound to you like people that are joyous? Does it sound to you like people that are happy? Does it sound to you like people that gracefully received the gospel? So I'm trying to show you all that, that all the power of God to compel men, to change men, to bring closeness, to build a strong community of believers is locked up inside the gospel. If only we will preach it right. The other factors that must be in alignment are time and chance. However, these factors will eventually align. The time will always come and you will always get the chance. But we must have the right message and a formidable channel to share it. You must be, we must prepare ourselves to carry the message of the gospel and represent it correctly. Not interspersed, not, you know, not interrupted with doctrines or, or culture or personality or religious practices, which are not necessarily bad if they were founded on the gospel. But the real foundation, the base of it, the prima of it is your gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I beg to say, sorry. I'm trying to show you what happens when the gospel of Christ is preached correctly. Now you might say, is it all about preaching? What, what if I don't have a platform to preach? Or what if they don't listen? And as a matter of fact, there are many that will not listen to you. The moment you say, I want to invite you for Bible study. I want to invite you for a conference. I want to invite you for a retreat. There's a lot of people that won't listen to you. Or there's a lot of people you probably invited over and over and over again and they didn't show up. But please stay with me as we discuss this further. And I'll go to the second outline, reaching out. How do we reach out? And I put here, the first thing is to understand human nature. The first thing to in reaching out is to understand the person you are sent to understand the people you are sent to let's even understand how people are wired how are people formed especially when we're talking about women we need to understand what is unique about this species of people what is their need it's key man is a tripartite being he has a is a soul is a spirit is a body Sisters, we must learn the ways of the spirit if we must be effective in this world. There's no way around it. God is called the father of all spirits. And the first thing we must learn in contending for souls is that it starts in the place of prayer. That your prayers will build a personality in you that will be the exact thing that people need to see or experience in a matter of time and place. Isaiah 62 and verse 1, it says, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's, for Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet. Till our righteousness shines out like the dawn. <laughs> a salvation like a blazing torch. I love that scripture so much, so much. It says, until our righteousness breaks forth. Until our, until our salvation shines like a blazing torch. I will not hold my peace. How long can you, not, can you, have, can you be at unrest for, for a soul? I must not be distracted by the outward appearance or experience. I've said this before. We must see people as souls that need nurture, that need love, that need salvation, that need comfort. We must become the atmosphere of comfort. Let me ask you something. Are you approachable? Even to a sister, even to a fellow girl, to a fellow sister, to your fellow woman, are you approachable? If you can break the soul barrier of a person, then you can reach their spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit working within you to fix what is broken, surgically remove what needs to be removed and add what must be added. Do you see through the lens of the spirit? See, one thing we must know is that God did not intend, God never intended for our differences to separate us. It is so that we can sharpen each other, so that we can pour into each other, that I can see something I'm lacking and I can approach a fellow sister, that, please, can you teach me this or can you give this to me? Or I can see something that someone is lacking and I can say, oh, I think this is, I think you need this and I can successfully give it to them. That is what God expected our differences we do, that we bring us together. See, we all come to the unity of faith. Do you see through the lens of the spirit? Many of us are blinded by cultural, doctrinal, personality, experiential differences that we cannot reach people because of it. You feel, oh, my experience is different, so I don't think I'll be able to affect them. I don't share that experience. I don't think I'll be able to, you know, 
make any difference in their life. I don't think I cannot relate. That's what that's what many of us say. I can't relate. So even when we do try to reach out to people, sometimes we push them away further. But trust and trust me, I've been there. I'm, this is not even a, this is not an accusation. I've been there. I've been wrongfully judged because of you know differences, and I've also wrongfully judged people because I thought we're oh, so different. Surely they must not be Christian enough. That someone's brand of Christianity does not look like yours does not mean that they are not Christian enough. Allow God to be the judge of that. Align yourself with heaven to determine what is the need of that soul at that point in time. There is a time where the word of God must come as a sword, dividing the soul and the spirit, the joy and the marrow. But there is a time that the word of God must come as a living water to a thirsty soul to bring comfort. And there is a time that the word of God can only be packaged in a kind gesture, a compliment, a good wish. Because tell me why Jesus eating with Zacchaeus meant that today salvation has come to your house. We must learn to carry the Holy Spirit regularly in our everyday life. It's the same way that God works in us, that he will reach people. The Holy Spirit does not assist us to the point of changing ourselves and then stop and leaves us to go and change other people. No! The Holy Spirit starts a work in you and he continues that work so that he can reach out through you to other people. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken your mortal body to become what you need to become, to become who you need to become, to reach other people, to change other men. And the Holy Spirit that is powerful enough to save you is powerful enough to save another person and another person and another person and another person. How do we then approach personality differences? I'm a sanguine, they're a choleric, they're a phlegmatic, I'm a, I'm a whatever. They're an introvert, I'm an extrovert, I'm an extrovert, they are an introvert. We must put personality aside and begin to learn and exhibit the ways of love. If you're a believer, you are born again there's only one personality you are called to have and that is the personality of love how do i know this we cannot insist on a person without love love insists that is what love does it is in the character of love to leave the 99 and go after one lost sheep it is in the character of love to wait at the gate daily hoping and firmly convinced that a long lost prodigal son will return home love runs up to meet up with a prodigal child, kisses and embraces him, and then throws a party to announce, my long lost son is back. The person we must become is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 4. Love is patient and kind, does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not exist, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Love is the most powerful tool. Love is a force. And love is the personality that we are called to become. Love is the personality that we are called to bear. All these things that love is, is whom we must become to be able to reach out to anyone. Galatians 5 and verse 20 lists all the characteristics of love, or which is otherwise called the fruit of the spirit. And it says that against anyone who practices these things, there's no law. There's no law anywhere that can judge you. Love is a force. Love is powerful. God is love. We know that the scripture says that we are living epistles. Second Corinthians chapter 3 from verse 2 and 3. It says, and we know that the love of God was... Second Corinthians, and so we are living epistles, and that's from Second Corinthians 3, um, from verse 2 and 3. And in Romans 5, verse 5, it says that the love of God was, has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. So it's something that you already have. You just have to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You have to work out the work that the Holy Spirit is doing within you. And take note, work out, work out. The Holy Spirit is working within. You are working out. You are working to show it. In alignment with the Holy Spirit, in total submission with the Holy to the Holy Spirit, in total surrender to the Holy Spirit, we are God's letters to humanity, 
And I pray that when people look at the pages of our lives, they can see and experience God's own love, touching and healing their souls, bringing them back in reconciliation to the Father and to the household of faith. Because the truth is, it's not everyone who we feel like we need to reach out to that has actually been cut off from God. We need to realize that. Some of them are not necessarily cut off from God. As a matter of fact, they still pray, they still hear from God, but some of them have been cut, out, cut off from the household of faith. They've decided in their hearts, I'm not going to go to church anyway. Church has hurt me. This pastor hurt me. That sister said something in church. This sister broke my trust. Or some of them have had really bad breakups in church. A brother has broken their heart. Someone has said something about them. They didn't really appreciate and they left the church. So when we talk about reaching out, we're not just talking about saving sinners. There's some of our sisters that have just decided to leave because they, they've had enough. But they just don't see how they could trust anyone else again. So we're not just saving the lost. Sometimes it's just about calling someone to come back home. We miss you in fellowship. Come back to us. You are one of us. Because the Bible says we should not forsake the gathering of the brethren. People love to have someone they can relate to. You need to one, one that thing you need to realize is that in this life, not everyone that seemingly appears as though they have a problem is necessarily looking for a solution. Especially the fact that we live in a very sensitive age. We live in a very sensitive, we're a very sensitive generation, you know. I think millennials are even a bit better. Gen Z's are, oh my God, they're so sensitive. Especially if you live in this part of the world. So people need someone they can relate to. It's almost like, oh, if you haven't been in my shoes, you can't have the tools to solve my problem. And that isn't always true. Sometimes experiences are valid in approaching a person and reaching out. But I tell you that in some cases, it's not always true. A person can have the tools to help you without necessarily having been in your shoes for once. So people love to have someone they can relate to. And that's why you hear the phrase, oh, you can't understand a lot. It's a very common phrase. And people just throw it around, around casually. But indirectly, what they're saying is, I don't think you've ever been in my shoes. So I don't think you can help me out. And if you haven't, I make bold to tell you that compassion can bridge that gap. If you haven't been in their shoes, compassion can bridge that gap. If you haven't had a bad breakup, Compassion can bridge that gap. If you haven't been church hurt or if you were church hurt and you got over it quickly, I've been church hurt, but I got over it so quickly because I didn't come here to find no man. I came here to find God. But compassion can bridge that gap if that's never been your problem. If their situation has never been your situation, if their case has never been your case, compassion is what's going to make up for that. Scripture says that Jesus can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, that it was in every way tempted as we were. So we too, we must be touchable. Allow yourself to feel things. Allow yourself to feel people's pains. Allow yourself to feel people's joy as well. People's infirmities must be able to touch you. Not to touch you, to break you. But so that despite the fact that you've not had the experience, you can feel feel what they're feeling you can relate to them you can know how to communicate with them with you know sensibility and sensitivity but to uh, to 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 achieve a goal to an end result we must allow the holy spirit to do the work of love in our hearts you know this thing keeps, keeps coming up is the theme of love but i believe that the whole christian culture can be summed up in love you know we must allow the holy spirit to do the work of love in our hearts because this is where the issues of life comes from we must let the love of God bind us. The love of God shield our hearts, protect our hearts. And then the issues of love can flow out. The capacity of our love tank must be enlarged to receive all sorts of women that the Lord will be bringing our way. That even if you cannot relate by life experience, you can relate by having the key to their breakthrough. Or by being the listening here that they need. That's all some people need. Just someone to listen to them rant. I have friends like that in my life. They are for ranting. And when I'm done, they'll say, it's fine. Sorry. They don't say much. They just listen. It might be the shoulders that people need to cry on. They just want to cry. They don't want no solution. They don't want no suggestions. They, don't, they just want to cry. And they'll be fine once they're done crying. And to be honest, not everyone is going through hardship. Enough of the emotional drama. Not everyone is going through hardship. Which brings me to my next point. The principle of a little here, a little there. 
A little text goes a long way. A little birthday card, showing up for events, a spontaneous phone call. I shall be you will not do. Attend ceremony, you will not attend. Let come and be in the surprise proposal, you will not be there. Come for baby shower, you will not come for. And you are shouting in the place of prayer, go give me sister, I better do so or I will die. Go out. Show up for people. Show up for people. Let them say you are everywhere. Thank you. I know what I'm looking for. I know what I'm looking for. I call it the principle of a little here, a little there. Prayer is not just the place to say, oh God, give me this soul or I die. It's the place to receive clear insight, precise revelation as to what the status report of a sister's soul is. You don't get now God can tell you this is exactly what you need to say. This is exactly what you need to become at this time and at this point. It's the place where we get a word that will touch the soul of a man like Jesus. That they will know that this is God. It's the place where our personality and our character can align with that of God, with that of heaven to touch lives. But honestly, be intentional. Like an Instagram post. Comment on their birthday. Go under their comments. Post somebody's picture. Just comment on someone's page. If you see that they're doing a course, just support. Even if it's not something you can relate to. If they are going to orphanage, follow them. Or send some money if you have. If you don't have it, give your time. Give your service. Can you cook? You know? Do something. There are five love languages. There's, there's the words of affirmation. Do that one. It's cheap. It's readily affordable. If you can't write some, something, have someone manufacture one. Have some very good friends. They are very good at writing. Very, very good. Have someone write something. If you can't write it. If you read it, if you read it and it looks like something you can write, send it to them. Encourage them. Oh, you're doing a good job. Someone has passed their clicks. Celebrate them. A little here, a little there. Just call. Be nice. Be, be the nice girl. It doesn't hurt. I'll forever be grateful for two of my friends that showed up at my place a few years back. And they were like, ah, you cannot be like this. Because at that point, I was about to drop out of a course I was doing. I was tired. I had had enough. I was going through life. I was really going through it. And I was like, I think I'm just going to drop everything that it, I'm not going to die if I don't do them. And at that point, my education was one of it. And I was like, I'm going to give up. My friend, one of my friends said, no way. My deadline was approaching. There was no way I was submitting my proposal before the deadline was up. Two sisters, they sat down with myself making three. Let's see the topic you have. They looked at the topics. Okay, this one looks like we can do it. You take paragraph one. You take introduction. I will take conclusion. That's how we sat down there. We started to write it. After a few hours, proposal was done. The next day, I submitted. A few days later, proposal was approved. Went on to do my research work. Those ladies literally saved my life. They saved my education. A little here, a little there. And I'll forever be grateful. Till date, when people ask me for my research paper, I just laugh because it's not really my work. <laughs> it's not really my work. I mean, my research paper is my work, but the proposal wasn't really my work. They saved me. You know? If we know anything about women, it's the fact that we're emotional beings. We're emotional beings. And it's not a bad thing. It's a strength. Because then it makes it easy for people to decipher your need. It makes it easy for people to approach you. It makes it easy for reasonable people to become what you need. Because they can see how you feel. Even without you necessarily uttering a word. So I'm asking you, sisters. Can you appeal to your fellow sisters' emotions? Can you relate to them on their level? You know? Are you still human or have you become a spirit now? We can no longer speak English to you again. Before we speak three words, you are speaking in tongues. Or before we speak four words, you are, you are already taking things into the realm of mysteries. And that's not bad. But you got to know your audience. You have to know what that person needs in that time and in that place. I remember someone saying to me one time, oh, I think I'm pregnant. And I thought... Oh my God, I went off. You needed to see me going off at this person. And this was somebody that even regarded me as friend. You needed to see me going off. And I was like, how could you even get involved with that kind of person? I was ranting back and forth. To cut the long story short, she wasn't pregnant. But it placed a very serious strain on our relationship until today. 
the strain is still there it's it's mended but it's not mended mended and the bad news is that was the worst possible reaction i could have had in that time and in that place because i was like this person's life is about to change 360 degrees probably way earlier than they thought in life and this was the worst reaction i could have it was sad i mean for me and sometimes i still judge myself right why did I do that? Why was I that way? I should have been the supportive friend in that time, you know, but I've, I know better. I, I know better now. And I'm not just sharing these stories with you to entertain you. I'm sharing it so that you can learn because I feel like these are such real things that we do and we make all these mistakes. We don't see God presenting to us an, an opportunity to reach lives. We don't see God presenting to us an opportunity to be there for people, to be God to them, to be Jesus to them in that time that they actually need us. The last thing I'm, I'm going to say, I didn't really write much on this, but I feel like it's important to mention that before we can be able to reach out to people, we must be whole. We must be healed in ourselves so that we will not be wounded soldiers that will be wounding others. We must come to a place of security within ourselves. We must have figured out ourselves. Maybe not totally, but to an extent. And if we have not, we just need to be honest to just say that, you know what? I don't know everything. You know what? I don't have all the solution, but maybe I could point you to someone who can help. You know, it's good to be honest. It's good to say, I don't have the solution to this problem. I don't understand this thing because we're talking about reaching the unreachable. But what about those people we have, we can actually reach? What about those people that are within the confines of our environment, but we can't, we don't really have the tools to help them. Are we honest enough to tell them, I can't really help you, but I'll be there for you how I know how to. Now, when it comes to reaching the unreachable, it's about it's the soul we are contending for. And we can't really do that if we're not in partnership with the Holy Spirit in the place of prayer and baptized and grounded and rooted in the love of God. Because these are the forces that can really help us. So we need to, we must be healed. We ourselves must be on a journey to healing. Not that somebody will tell you, oh, if you see what my pastor did to me and your first reaction is, ah, they've done it to me before like that. Isn't that that church? That cannot be our first reaction. Or that cannot be our final reaction. Be compassionate. Be kind. Don't be the one pulling people apart by your words. And sometimes we don't do it on purpose. I've I've done it before. It's not something I haven't done before. And that's why I can talk about it. We, we, we don't do it on purpose, but we need to come to a place of healing where we no longer take things to heart or where at least our hearts are not the first things that come to our mind. And we begin to relate with people from a standpoint of, ah, that's a broken sister. Oh, I'm another broken sister. Let's start to relate. Let's form broken sisters association. No, we want a community of people that are healing, a community of people that have been made whole whole a community of people that have let go of the past let go of the pain let go of the hurt and are ready to be bouncing soldiers are ready to be active soldiers for christ people that women who are ready to be women of valor proper king's women the sisterhood is beautiful it's very very beautiful finally you are not there shall die else you shall die you can't do everything. Prayer is the start is the starting point and it's the ending point of everything. So when you have thrown your fetcher into the well and it keeps coming back empty, you retreat into the place of prayer. And the truth is some people's salvation are not attached to you. You need to know that. You might not be the deliverer sent to a particular person, but your prayer can prepare their heart. Your prayer can preserve them until the day that they meet their destiny helper. Your prayer can move God to speak to them in a dream, in a vision. Matthew 9 and verse 38. Pray ye the Lord of harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. That's your prayer point. John 6 and verse 44. No man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up on the last day. That is your prayer. John 10 and verse 16. I have other, other sheep that are not of this sheep pen, but I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. 
It's beautiful that that is the promise of Jesus himself. That is the promise of Jesus himself. It's the promise of the good shepherd. And we can rest knowing that he that has called us is faithful and he will surely bring what he has said to pass. Keep loving. Keep praying. And I pray that everyone who is lost, everyone who is far away, everyone who has been locked either outside of the faith, uh, outside of the household of faith, outside of the fellowship, the, the bond of love and fellowship that we share, or even outside of the camp of God as a total. I pray that the compelling power of the gospel will bring them back. But I'm trying to show you that everything that you have, everything that you need to bring men back, to compel men, to reach and save, is locked up inside of the gospel. We just need to we just need to, to, to be able to decipher the power within the gospel of Jesus. It's the power of God unto salvation. And love is a force that no man can resist. No man born of a woman. No woman born of a woman can resist. I pray, I, I really hope you've learned something from this video. Watch it again. You can feel free to put me in the background as you go about your daily activities. I'll watch it again as well. But I do hope that I've been able to reach out to your heart. I do hope that you've been able to get some tools from this conversation. Feel free to pop your comments, your questions in the comment section and I'll respond or someone else can um, respond. Feel free to reach out to me as an individual. But finally, I'm grateful for all the people that reached out to me while I was down. And I feel like that's why I can really talk about this topic. And I pray that the compelling power of the gospel will, will reveal itself in us to compel all those people that we carry as burdens in our hearts. I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit will work within us to furnish us and to shape us into what we must become, into who we must become, to reach out to save those that are lost. In the name of Jesus Christ, we have prayed. Thank you for watching the video and I really, really appreciate the opportunity. I want to say thank you to the leadership of the Sisters Forum FCN. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye.